We'll be in Hebrews. Once again, chapter 11, verse 13. Of course, Hebrews 11 starts with now faith. Verse 2, by it. That's faith. Verse 3, by faith. Verse 4, by faith. Verse 5, by faith. Verse 6, without faith. 7, faith. 8, faith. 9, faith. 11, faith. The verses that we're going to look at right now speak about faith. And I know a lot of times people, people wonder, they struggle. Do I have faith? Do I not have faith? At first reading, these verses that we're about to look at, you, you may not see much at first, but I think as we dive in, you'll see that these, these may be some of the most helpful statements made about faith in all the Bible just as far as identifying where it is. Do you have it? Do I have it? What does it look like? What's the nature of true saving faith? Let's pick up here in verse 13. These all died in faith. Now who's that? These all. You know what? That sounds to me like more than just Abraham and Sarah. He's, he's already hit us with Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah. These all died in faith. I get the, I get the feeling he, he's referring to all of them. As well as all of them that he's going to present to us here. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. Now just stop right there. Go to verse 39. And all these, I think these are the same people, These all died in faith. All these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. And that's what it says in 13. These all died not having received the things promised. The same truth is there. Verse 40, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Now what does that mean? What does it sound like when it says God had provided something better for us? Does that mean we get something better than they got? Does that... The feeling that I get here is this. That there were certain promises that they were looking forward to, mainly concerning the fulfillment of Christ that we now look back on. It's been fulfilled. Not, not that when we pass out of this world and in the, the eternal realm to come that we have something better than the Old Testament saints had. Not that. It's that we have something better now than what they had when they lived. But the, the fact is, they didn't get what was promised to them. And some things they got. They got Isaac. But they didn't get this innumerable number of offspring like the sand of the sea. They never, got, they never saw that. We've had many of the fulfillments of Christ, but there's a lot of promises that we... You know, the fact is, the same thing can be said about us that's said there in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised. And I'll tell you this, when we die, we don't receive everything yet promised either. I mean, what things are promised that we don't get the day, I, that, the day we die? I mean, one thing ought to jump right out at you. We don't, get, we don't get our resurrection body the day you die. 
They didn't get it, and we don't get it. Not all the promises are fulfilled. The fullness, the culmination is not going to be until Christ comes the second time and, the, and judgment day is past. So we die the way they do. If we die, Christians, we die in faith, not having received the things promised. But having seen them and greeted them from afar, some things they got, some things they didn't. Some things we get, and we may have some better things that we've already got as far as Knowledge as far as what we know about Christ. I mean, the, the fullness of the revelation of what we have in Christ, they, they obviously didn't have, although they did see Christ. I mean, that, isn't that what Christ said Himself about Abraham? He saw my day. He saw Christ, but not as clearly as we do. They greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. Now, here's the life of faith. These people lived. They died in faith. They did not acquire everything that had been promised, that they hoped for. That's the picture. Now when you take this life of the believer, you can can see that our author, the author of Hebrews, he has some imagery in mind here as he's thinking about the life of the Christian. The lives of these people who live by faith. And if you you drop down to chapter 12, verse 1, I want to kind of... Every once in a while, I think it's important for us to stop for just a moment where we are in Hebrews and try to recollect the big picture. And I I want you to see what's going on inside of, of the mind of the writer. Do you see chapter 12, verse 1? Therefore. Do you know what that does for us? it builds off all this stuff that we have happening in 11. What I want you to recognize is that as He's telling us all this stuff in chapter 11 that He's telling us, He's going to insert a therefore right at the beginning of chapter 12. Why? Because after all that He says, He now wants to encourage us with something about everything that was true in their life. Listen, Look at what He does. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Well, that's that's what he's doing in chapter 11. He's establishing this this cloud of witnesses for us. He's, He's showing us the reality of their presence. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, I just, I want you to see something here. As, as, our author is considering these people. They all died in faith. They were, they were counted themselves these strangers in this place, exiles, sojourners, aliens, and they're, they want a better country. They're looking for a city whose foundations are not of this, this world and its machinery, but something that God has laid. As he looks at all this, he kind of has. His imagery seems a little bit divided in my mind. You know what he sees on the one hand? Witnesses. I mean, what do you think of when you think of a witness? I think of a courtroom. I think of a jury, a judge, a witness stand. But on the other hand, he has this imagery of a race. I mean, you kind of have both going on here. They're running a race. A race that requires endurance. Do you see that? He says, let us run with endurance. What kind of race needs endurance? 
a marathon, a long distance run, not just a short sprint, but who ever heard of there being witnesses at a race or a witness stand? I mean, can you imagine? It's like he's bringing the courtroom and the marathon and he's putting them together. Which that's okay, right? I mean, when you're using imagery, you can do that. We, mix, we often mix metaphors and similes, and it's fine because it, it communicates still. But that, that is the picture. What's the connection between a marathon and a witness stand? And what's, what's the connection? And you can, you can imagine in your mind a marathon and people are running. And oftentimes during, when you have a marathon, you have spectators that line the, the path that you run or the road or the street, whatever. And what are those spectators usually doing? Cheering, encouraging. They might hand you water, something. But, but the thing about it is what, what our author wants us to see. In fact, I was just... You know, not too long ago, we had this, this Boston Marathon bombing. And if I recall right, they said that they were telling the story about a man and a woman who ran in that race. And the man finished a lot earlier. And he actually then came back in that last stretch there. And he stood there along the, the run. And he was waiting for his wife to come. And I don't remember if they were involved in it or if their story just got there, but but that's that's the idea here. You, You see, the spectators that this guy has in mind are not just anybody, just any old cheerleader. He's got in mind people that have already run the race, that have actually doubled back and now stand alongside the this marathon and they're witnessing. They're not just cheerleading. They're witnessing. And what are they witness to? I mean, it was kind of like we saw two weeks ago with Sarah. Remember we looked at her? And I know some of the brethren were telling what encouragement they found the fact that Sarah would be there. Why? Because at times, there seemed to be failure. There seemed to be falls. And that's, that's what they're, they're there and they're witnessing to the fact we ran the race and we got to the finish line. That's what it means when it says these all died in faith. That's the finish line, brethren. They're saying we made it in our weakness and we're made of the same stuff you are. They're going alongside us as we're running this race and they're saying, I mean, you know what happens? You know, if... What, what do runners call it when they get to a point in the race where they feel like they want to quit? Hitting the wall. And, and if anything, if you remember the broader scope of the book that we're looking at, what has happened to these folks, to this church or this group of people that our author is addressing? Where are they at? I mean, you go over to chapter 12, we're going to see it in a little bit. Where were their hands? Drooping. What was going on with their knees? Weak. Well, I mean, you have words in this book like sluggish, dull. This is a group of people that have been in the race, and they started well, and they were moving along well, and they were were going through that. I mean, just look back at chapter 10. Look back at chapter 10, verse 32. Recall the former days. When what? After you were enlightened. Well, what, what's that enlightenment? Brethren, that's the gun. That's the, that's the starting block. This is what happened. And then what, what happened in those former days? They endured a hard struggle with sufferings. They were running. They were running well. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. Sometimes being partners with those so treated. You had compassion on those in prison. You get an idea about what it is to run the race well. You had compassion on those in prison. Love. Sacrificial love. That's what it is to run well. That's what he says the reason is why you shouldn't forsake assembling together. 
I mean, you, you want to hit the wall in this race? Just bail out of meeting with God's people. They're having compassion on those in prison. You're not running this race well unless you're running this race as a run of love and you're pouring yourself out for others. If you're not giving yourself to others, you're not running well. You may not be running at all. I mean, did, are we not told somewhere that our love demonstrates what we really are? I mean, brethren, if, if you don't have a love for the brethren and you say you belong to Christ, there's, there's no truth in that. We have that on scriptural authority. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance. You see what's happening there? They're, they've hit the wall. And, and right there in the beginning of chapter 2, the warning is don't drift, don't drift. They're drifting back to the world. They're drifting to into that mode of coast. They're drifting and living on past victories. That's why he's saying yes, 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 yes. There are victories in the past. There are, but you can't live on them. You can't live on yesterday. You can't live on how you ran back at the beginning of the race. It's true you endured back then. But it is true you suffered back then. It is true you loved back then. But you need endurance and you're getting to a place where you're beginning to drift you're beginning to become dull and sluggish that's what's happening and that's what happens to us at times we get to the point where we're ready to hit the wall well, we, we ran well but we're tired, we're weary you know what the truth is that as we're running along I mean you saw those pictures of the Boston Marathon it's, they're running it through the city you've got people walking over on the sidewalks and they're shopping you've got people over there sitting you know, drinking their margaritas at the, at the little cafes over there watching the run and you know what while you're running you're looking over at those people and you're thinking it's a whole lot easier over there and I'm, I'm getting tired here and what the author is doing is he's bringing in a not just, some, not just one or two witnesses. A cloud of witnesses means he, he wants you to get this idea that there's, there's bunches of them. And they're saying, keep going. This is a race worth winning. And we won. We got to the end. And we weren't any more special than you are. We're just as weak and the grace of God carried us through just the same. And it's sufficient. And you can make it. Keep running. Press on. Keep going. Don't drift. Don't fall out. Yes, your knees are weak. Yes, you feel like you want to lay down. But don't take a nap. It's not time. You're not home yet. You're still in the enemy's land. You're not in your homeland. You're not in the city that you seek. You're not in the better place. Don't give up. And I'll tell you what, everything is at stake. Your soul is at stake. And I mean, this author would have us just throw right out the window any idea of once saved, always saved. What, you believe you can lose your salvation? That's not what I mean. What I mean is this, is true faith is enduring faith. You can test the quality and the character of faith by whether it endures or not. And if it doesn't endure, it's no good. You will not be saved unless you endure to the end. True faith will always endure to the end. But I'll tell you what, you've got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You've got to work out this race. You've got to run. You've got to run and you've got to put forth the effort and you've got to work this thing. Abiding in Christ. Looking to Him in faith. Believing that He's going to give you the ability to do it. You keep running, trusting Him. What does it say? What does it say there in chapter 12? I mean... You, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Looking to ourselves, looking to our own strength, looking for strength in one another. It doesn't say that. It says looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. That's what's happening. I'll, I'll tell you, it is easier to drift and to go meander with the martini drinking crowd over on the side. It's easy. I mean, I was just up in Michigan. And I went to see my cousins. And my cousin said, one of my cousins said to me, 
Well, you know we have needs here in Michigan, too. And there was a moment that was enticing. And not because God was leading me to start a church there. Not because I heard the voice of God calling me to a labor there. But it's all the things, it's all the things that draw us, that say, you know, come away from that. Come away from the race. Come back. It's real easy. And and the fact is, the race is hard. There's, There's never anything harder that anyone has to do than winning the Christian race. It's the the hardest thing man knows. There is nothing harder. It's hard. And I'll tell you this, no one ever said it was easy. Except liars and false teachers. It's not easy. And Scripture knows it's not easy. And Scripture expects us to hit the wall. You just look at the tone of the letters in Scripture. Young, I'll tell you, some, some of you have heard Don Johnson's testimony about when he first got saved. And he said, you know, he just, he, he's got this picture of just arms crossed behind his head laying out on these grassy slopes and watching the clouds billow past and just thinking, you know, the Christian life is just, it's just one baptism of the Spirit after another. That's what he thought. That's what he'll say. And you know what the truth is? That whether you had exactly that experience or not, I have found young believers almost can't hear Scripture when it says things like, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. It's almost like it's in Chinese, right? It's like, this is so great. You just discovered Christ. You discovered eternal life. You're, you're full of joy unspeakable. And what could ever damp this? You can't even hear words like that. If you're children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. And and you know what happens? You can say that to a young believer right over their heads. Ah, life is fun. Life is carefree. We're young. We just got saved. We're excited. Peter says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But you know what happens? We are surprised. We're told not to be, but we are. I mean, I watch young people who have been converted get to that time, that point where the, the fire starts to cook under them. And I watch how they respond. And, and you know what the truth is? The reality of Matthew 13, that second soil, the stony soil, that it proves true. You get difficulty, the sun comes out, and some go away. Some will just leave the church. You know, it's the church's fault that things are so hard. But you watch people. You watch young people, they get there. And, and I, I look, I've walked that same path. You, you go through it. it the, the types of trials God brings to us, they're so diverse. And it's, it's, it, it really does surprise us when we're told not to be surprised. But I'll tell you this, the author of Hebrews and the God that inspired him, they expect that no matter how difficult the road is, you don't drift. You run. This is about running well. And you've got this cloud of witnesses there for that purpose. They're witnessing to you. 
that abiding in Christ, you can finish this. You can make it through. You can get through. You can walk through the fires. We did. We were there. We endured these things. We made it. Now we're calling you on. You can do this. You can do this resting in Christ. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. You can do this. You can make this. This is about running, not drifting. Running, not becoming sluggish. you got to go. we got to keep going. And you can't live on the past. You've got, you've got to keep going today. Don't let anybody convince you that having once believed is okay and you can fall out and it's still okay. Jesus said you won't be saved unless you endure to the end. And that's what this is all about. If you fall back, that's how this whole section started. If you fall back, if you cave, if you turn around, if you shrink back, he says, My soul has no pleasure in him. This is a race that we need to run all the way to the finish line. You got to keep going. And the witnesses are there and they're calling us to it. So, these all died in faith. They died in faith. And the whole point is, let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. A- Andy Hamilton, oftentimes when he signs off on his emails to me, he says, onward. You know what? That has the idea that we're going somewhere. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't slow down. Don't stay where you are. Onward. Go. Don't fall away. Endure. Persevere. Press on. That's that's the idea of the book of Hebrews. You go through and you look at those verses that talk about continuing and keeping going and don't losing hope and don't give up and don't drift. Don't slow down. This is about looking to Christ today and pressing on. Going. These witnesses are there bearing witness. So that you and I might show our faith the same way they did. And they showed their faith. That's what the author of Hebrews wants us to see. He wants to give us example after example after example of how they did show their faith. And we need to be living that way today, looking to Jesus and showing our faith in the same way. Pressing on and trusting Him that He's going to be there. But now, I want us to think for a moment about the race. Now, a race. Basically, a race has a starting line, a starting point. The gun goes off. You have the race itself. And I mean, a professional runner might be able to break up the race itself into different strategic parts. But you, ba- you basically have the start line, the race, and the finish line. And, and I want to just think about the starting line for a second. The starting line. Look, look at Hebrews 11.13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. Now as I said before, this, this is the finish line. But look for the starting line here. They greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for people who speak thus make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. Now, watch this very carefully. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. Now, you know what's really interesting to me? These all died in faith. These all died in faith. That sounds like more than just Abraham and Sarah. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. Well, the thing is, literally, only Abraham and Sarah came out. But it's it's as though they're representative of all of us. And that's the starting point of the race. 
It's when you come out, right? When you come out of Ur of the Chaldees, that's where it starts. That's where his life of faith started. God told him, Abraham, come out. And and the idea here is, it's not just them. It's them all. They all had the ability to go back if they were so minded to do it. And that's true of all of us. All of us start the race when we hear the voice of God and it calls us out. The voice of God penetrates where we are and calls us out of the land of sin and the land of selfishness. I mean, you think about the places in Scripture where you have this kind of imagery. What was it, what was it that was said to Lot? Up! And out of Sodom, as flee to the hills or to the mountains. You have that reality concerning Babylon. Revelation 18.4 Come out of her, My people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. There's Isaiah 48.20 Go out from Babylon. Flee from Chaldea. Declare this with a shout of joy. Jeremiah 51.6 Flee from the midst of Babylon. Or Acts 2.40 Save yourselves from this crooked generation. That's, that's where the starting line is. That's where the race begins. It begins when you hear the voice of God call you out of where you are. Call you out of the city of destruction. That's what Bunyan was hitting on when here's Christian and suddenly what do you see? What is it that drives this man out of the city of destruction? It's the reality of that load on his back. The Spirit of God comes in and convicts you of sin and convicts you that the place you are is going to burn with fire and it's dangerous and you've got to escape. And you flee from the wrath to come. That's that's the starting point. When you up and leave, come out of her, my people. That's Have you never heard? Church. What does church mean? Ecclesia. It's a word that doesn't mean a building where religion takes place. It's a called out people. And in the very generic sense, it means a people called out of their homes into a public assembly. That's what it is. We as a church are a people called out. You have never really begun the race unless you have heard the voice of God tell you to come out, to flee. And you come out of there fleeing to Christ. That's the mountain. Escape to the mountains. The mountains of of this salvation that Christ offers. If you're still where you are, it's not a safe place. I mean, those of you, listen, those of you that love this world, those of you that love, Bunyan called it the city of destruction. Why do you think he would call it that? He would call it that because it's going to burn up with fire. And Peter tells us it's going to burn with fire. This place is destined to burn and you with it if you don't flee from the wrath to come. If you don't escape. And that's what happened to Abraham. That's where he started. He was called out. And that's where we all are at. We get called out. This, you know, let me, let me move on from there. That's the starting point of the race. But let's consider the race itself. You already saw the word endurance. For most of us, it's a marathon. The truth is, we don't know where the finish line is. But for most of us, it takes endurance because it's long. It's short in one sense, but it's hard and long in another sense. Endurance is not needed for sprints. Now I want to turn your attention to a great reality here. Look at 11.15. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. You know, you do have an opportunity to go back. And many do. Have you ever noticed in Pilgrim's Progress 
the number of people that Pilgrim meets who are going the opposite way? I mean, after the gate, after the cross. People that were seemingly already in the way. There's a place where Pilgrim is coming to the valley of the shadow of death. And it doesn't, Bunyan always liked to give names to the different people. But there's two men who are unnamed. And they come running up to him. And they're screaming mainly one thing. Do you remember? Go back. Turn back. Go back. Go back. And on they ran. Why? There were dangers. There were difficulties. And you know what the author is saying? They had opportunity to go back if they were minded to go back. And you have the opportunity to go back if you're minded to go back. You can go back if you're minded to go back. Listen. You need to understand one of the fundamental realities of saving faith is this. Faith is proven exactly at this point. Faith is proven when you do have the opportunity to return and don't do it. I mean, that, it's by that that you prove whether you're Christ or not. When you have opportunity to return and you don't return. And that's exactly what's going on. These people, they all died in faith. And what happened? They made it to the finish line. And how did they make it to the finish line? Because everywhere along the race where they had the opportunity to go back and the opportunity was there all the time. They weren't chained. They weren't shackled on the way. They could have freely gone off at any time. And the way they proved themselves real, the way they proved their faith was real, is by the very fact that every time it got difficult and the tempta- and there will be temptation to go back. Why? Because the devil knows those words. He knows the words, turn back. And he can whisper them in your ear or have them come through the mouth of a cousin who says, Tim, come back. He knows the words. And so you're going to hear them. You're going to hear them a lot. And because the fact is that when you're running this marathon, what does Scripture say? There is a course in this world And those who are dead in their trespasses and sins follow the course of this world. And they follow the course of the prince of the power of the air. And guess which way that course flows? Opposite to the way you run. And so everybody going down that stream is flowing past you and they're telling you, come with us, come with us, turn back. They're very happy to see you. They want you to come back. Because you mess with their conscience. They don't like you doing what you do. And the devil doesn't like you doing it. You remember, Apollyon confronts Pilgrim. And what does he want him to do? What's his main goal? Go back and I'll double your wages. Go back. And you have opportunity to do it. You have lots of opportunity to do it. But here is the reality of faith. And you need to get this. Because people are asking all the time, do I have faith? Do I really have the kind of faith that's going to get me to the finish line and and allow me to enter the glory land? Do I have the kind of faith that God is pleased with? Well, let's think about this. When you have opportunity to go back, and see, we're not really literally where Pilgrim was on this path. We're in our life. It's not like that's the path out there, Commerce Street, and we've kind of diverted off from it because we're over here this far removed from it, and so all we have to do is go back over there. The fact is, we live in real life where this this is spiritualized. What does it mean to go back? 
What is it to go back to where we came from? Brethren, it's, go back in, it's to go back in the course of this world. It's to go back and live for the things that the world lives for and to love the things that the world loves. What, what is this path? This is the path that we run with our eyes glued to Christ. This is trusting the promises of God and obeying Him. I mean, it, right? God commanded him to leave the Ur of the Chaldees, and he did. He obeyed. Faith obeys. It's hearing the Word of God. Jesus said it. Jesus said, here's the wise man. He builds his house on the rock. The storm's going to come, and it's going to stand. And what is all that? That is, he hears my Word, and he does it. This is faith. We look to God, we believe His promises. We look to God, we believe it is in our best interest to obey Him, to follow Him, to do what He says, to let this Word abide in our life. That's what He says. You prove to be His disciples if that's a reality. This is the path of the Word of God. It's the path of obedience to God. It's not everybody that enters the kingdom of God. It's those who do the will of My Father in heaven. It's the path of the will of God. It's striving in the power of Christ to do those things pleasing to Christ. That's the path. And to turn out of it is to go back into the path of the children of this world who are called children of what? of wrath, and they're sons of disobedience. That's what characterizes them. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's the path. It's lawlessness. It's going back into living the way you want to. You must die to self to be in this path. Unless you're willing to forsake all you have, and that includes your own life, you cannot be His disciple. And when you just want your life, when you want it your way, when you go back to your selfishness and your self-interest, and when you go back to your idols and you go back to just wanting to live for your pleasure, that's going back. And you have lots of opportunities. Ur of the Chaldees is a comfortable place. It's the martini sippers over on the side. And it's real inviting. Just slow down. Just coast. You're fanatics. Quit going to that church. They take it too seriously. Just stop. I mean, it's okay to be a Christian, but just, you know, be the politically correct kind. Don't be the kind that makes me uncomfortable. Don't be the kind. Don't talk to me about your Christ. Talk to me about the, talk to me about the you know, the, the Christ that's like a little baby in a manger. Talk to me about that one. It makes me feel real good about myself. And about all my materialism. Lots of opportunities. But listen, for, the, for true faith, and this is the test of true faith, what is it when things get hard and there's an opportunity to go back? What is it that prevents somebody from doing that? What stops you from doing that? What does true faith do at that point? And listen, the fact is, you can lay it down right here. There is a discontent with true faith. And you know what leads me to say that? Is this word in 11, 16. They desire They have a desire. Faith is driven by a desire. And and the inverse of that is faith is driven by a discontent. You have a desire for that, you're discontent with that. Right? I mean, that's what... And you know what's interesting? In verse 16, it says a better country in all of our translations, but you know in the original, there's no country there. They just supply it. Because... I mean, unquestionably, that's what he's talking about. But in the original, it's just this. They desire better. You see, that's the desire of faith. Faith believes that what is past the finish line is better. That's, That's true faith. Because it really believes it's better. You can say it's better, but if you don't continue running the race, you don't show that you really believe it. 
When you're running along and you look over there and you see the folks sitting around and meandering at the shops and you're running in the marathon and you're thinking, oh, that sure would feel good. Cool drink in hand, not running, not out here, not in this blazing sun, not working like I'm working and I'm hitting the wall and my body's shutting down and my knees are weak and I feel like I'm going to fall and oh, it's, it's shady over there and it's nice over there. You know what keeps you going? You know that there's a glory in finishing that finish line that those people aren't going to have. And you start looking over there and you recognize that in comparison with this eternal weight of glory that's at the end, what they've got, if you can see it, if you can put your glasses on and see, ah, what they're, they're really over there chewing on pig huffs. That's all it is. And to the Christian, that's what it is. We look around at the world and it, it, it tries to entice us. It's, it's this great big vanity fair and it's saying buy, buy, buy. But the Christian is running along in this race and saying I don't want to buy what you have to sell because I know it doesn't really satisfy. My heart is yearning and desiring a better country. And listen, it's not just a better country because it's another country. It's not just a better country because God built it. It's a better country, big brethren, because it's Emmanuel's land. It's where Christ is. It's, if you read about the city of God in Revelation, what is it that's so glorious about it? God is there. God is in their midst. God is the light. The lamp is the Lamb. It's, it's that. Their throne is there. That's where the abiding place, the abiding place of God is with men. That's why they want to get there. That's why they they want this city. They want to see. Brethren, when Andy says onward, what does that mean? It means, brethren, we're headed to the temple to look into the face of Christ. That's what it means. That's where we're going. And we can look over at the martini sippers over here and we say, I don't want that. I want the face of Christ. It's better. I desire that. And it drives us forward. And that's what true faith is. It looks at that and it says, I see a Christ in the pages of these, this book and I want Him. I want His glory. I want to see Him and I'm not going to be satisfied till I have that. I've tasted of this world and I've caught a glimpse of that city and a glimpse of the Christ of that city. And just the glimpse just causes this to pale. And I want that. You see, brethren, this is what happens when... Those people that make up that second soil type in, uh, in Matthew 13, here's what happens. They receive the truth gladly. They hear about Christ, they receive it gladly. Listen, it's, it's a glad thing to hear. You don't have to go to hell. Sin's forgiven. But what happens? Persecution comes out. And what's the real issue? The real issue is being comfortable over there on the sidelines and not being persecuted is more desirable than Christ. I treat Christ as a trifling thing. I walk off the, the route where everybody's running here and I go sit down over there because I didn't really want Christ more than comfort. I wanted comfort more than Christ. I counted Christ and, as, as a small thing. And His salvation is a small thing. And seeing Him face to face and eternal glory, I count it as... And you know, you know what Paul talked about? Those that count themselves unworthy. You remember how he came to the Jews first? And he said, you judge yourselves or count yourselves unworthy of eternal life. And that's what men do. They walk off. And I'll tell you this, have you ever noticed? I, I seem to recall one day our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 6. I seem to recall Him standing there by the marathon route and watching one and another and another and another step off the race. And He let them go. You're free to go back. He not only let them go, He turned to the guys that were still on the path he said, you guys want to go, come off too? It's like, what, Lord, you're inviting us to do it? And he, he, didn't, he didn't stop the ones that left.
And I'll tell you what it says. It says, therefore, God. Notice what it says. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Notice the therefore. Why? Why is God not ashamed to be called their God? Because they desire Him. They desire Him more. I'll tell you this. God is not ashamed. That's that's the negative, right? God is not ashamed. Which means God is what? He's glad. He's proud to own those who so believe He's worth having. Who so believe He's a treasure to go sell everything in order to be able to buy that land, to have that treasure. It says, He's not ashamed to be called our God. He'll gladly have us own Him if we're driven by a faith that really believes He's better and produces a desire in us to have it even if it costs us our life. That in all the occasions that we could turn back, we don't turn back. Brethren, I, I, know, so, I know somebody's going to fault me for quoting C.S. Lewis. It seems like every time I do, uh, somebody has something to say. I like the Chronicles of Narnia. seems like every time we travel on a trip, uh, we have those on CD, and so they typically get played when we have these long 20-hour trips. And uh, there's, in, in Prince Caspi in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, there's a place where they are getting towards the end of the world, which there at the end of the world is Aslan's country, which is a picture of glory. And they are sailing. And they are getting closer and closer and closer. And they get to the last island before the end of the world and Aslan's country. And a lot of the men, the crew, they're thinking that maybe about turning back. Maybe we should go back. And it's really a picture of this. And it's interesting how Lewis portrays it. Prince Caspian hears these men as they're, they're debating among themselves about whether they've gone far enough and the, the journey's been far and maybe they should turn and go back. And he says to them, Men, he says, you misunderstand. He says, do you think all the glories that are to be had here at the end of the earth are to be had for a song? He says, do you, he's telling them, do you not re- recognize the privilege that it is going to be for anybody to be accepted to go and explore this place? The title of Dawn Treader will be bequeathed to you and your ancestors. The gold, the silver, the lands that will be given. He says it's not as though we're desperate to have people come. This is the greatest honor of anybody to be able to go. It's not to be bought for a song. And when I hear that, it's like this this race, brethren, we're on. I mean, sometimes people act like, you know, whether they keep going or not, it's just not a big deal. Or, or, you know, whether they fall out of the race or whether they come to your church, almost like, you know, almost like they want to twist your arm to let them. It's like, what? This isn't to be bought for a song. We're talking eternal life. We're talking the eternal riches of Jesus Christ. We're talking what Paul said is not just... Paul said to depart and be with Christ. He didn't just say it was better. He said far better. He didn't say there was just glory out there. He said there is an eternal 
weight of glory. There, this isn't to be bought with a song. You can go back. You can go back if you will go back and Jesus will let you go back. As He let those in John 6 go back. This, this, there is a crown of righteousness. There is a crown of life. There is an eternal life. There is a city. There is a country. And oh, it is a better country. And once in a while, some of us, just like those delectable mountains that are talked about in Pilgrim's Progress, the first place where Pilgrim was able to get a glimpse of the celestial city. Brethren, if any of you have had glimpses of this, and the more glimpse you have, this is to be had at all cost. This is to be had whether you had to live a thousand lifetimes and give them all in a dungeon. Lay it all down at the stake. Brethren, this isn't to be had for a song. And you're never promised that it will be had that way. You're promised that through much tribulation. Listen, it's free and it'll cost you everything. You say, that's a paradox. Christ earned the merit, but it will cost you everything. Brethren, it'll be the hardest thing that you ever do, but all the joys at the end, what riches are at the end, it's it's altogether glorious at the end. I mean, I was just thinking on, on Wednesday, we were thinking about... The, the blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And, it, and we were talking about they shall be satisfied. And we were thinking about some scriptures about satisfaction. And I went and I looked at several of them that we didn't mention. But just listen to these. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. Oh, to be in a place that's just absolutely holy. A land where there's no liars, where there's no sin. The Song of Solomon, the text that we were looking for, but we couldn't find. Here's Christ. I came to my garden. I mean, you crossed this finish line. Here's Christ. He looks at you and He calls you His garden. Gardens are places of flowers and beauty good things to eat. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. Look at the different names. I gathered my myrrh and my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. Eat, friends. Drink. And be drunk with love. I mean, I just, you, you, you're there. They say, come, greet the Lord. And He sees you. And this is His bidding of you. I want you drunk with Isaiah 25, 6, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined at the end of this is a finish line we don't expect to be here that long there's a finish line it's our death we don't know where it's at I can tell you one thing about these people they lived in faith and they died in faith As Bob Jennings said when he was here, when you get to the end, when you get towards that finish line, you don't want to have to do anything but die. You don't want to be on a sick bed racked with pain and be looking for a Savior there. These people lived by faith. And they died by faith. The best way to die by faith is to live by faith, not to wait and think that you're going to come and find a Savior at the end of your life. And that finish line... It takes endurance, but the truth is our lives are a vapor and they're gone. Brethren, we're aliens. We're strangers here. We're running in an enemy's land. Keep awake. Keep vigilant. 
Abide in Christ. Walk close to Him today. You need to run today. You need to look to Him and feast on Him today. You need to eat and drink of Him today. That's living by faith. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher. That's how you run the race. That's where you get the endurance. That's where you get the strength for that endurance. You need to run well today. Don't grow weary in well-doing Press on. This takes endurance. We're in an enemy's land. We're not in Emmanuel's land. We're running in an alien place. This is not our better land. This is not... Brethren, the next time you get get some urgency, you get anxious about worldly troubles, you just tell yourself, I'm not going to fret. This isn't going to last long. Paul called it momentary light affliction. You just tell yourself that. It's not going to last long. I mean, that next te- time you're tempted to rejoice in earthly treasures, remember the same thing. They're not going to last long. Say to yourself, that's but a shadow. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. I want to rejoice in something enduring. I want to rejoice in something better. Brethren, we're aliens running a race. Last week, Chuck Volo told me a story and I looked it up. I found various accounts, so I can probably use a little bit of liberty, but the story is of an old missionary couple. They'd been working in Africa for years, they were done, they were wore out, they were at the end. Their health was gone. Their years were gone. And they were just wiped out. They went to New York. They had given their lives away. They didn't have any pension. As is so often the case with people that labor for the Lord. No pension. No retirement. The fact is, As they embarked on this boat to come back to New York, they were on the same ship that Teddy Roosevelt was on. Roosevelt was returning from one of his big game hunting expeditions. So there he is on the boat. No one paid any attention to the missionaries. They watched all the fanfare that accompanied the president's entourage. They saw the passengers that were just trying to gather around him, catch a glimpse of the great man. As the ship moved across the ocean, the old missionary said to his wife, something's wrong. Why should we have given our lives in faithful service for God in Africa for all these many years And now we have no one care a thing about us. Here this man comes back from a hunting trip and everybody makes much over him. But nobody gives two hoots about us. He says when it, the story goes that when they arrived at the dock there in New York, the mayor and other dignitaries were there to meet Roosevelt. Papers full of the president's arrival. No one noticed the missionary couple. They slipped off the ship, disappeared in the crowd, and they were gone. And that night, the man's spirit was broke. He felt really discouraged. Nobody nobody noticed them. Nobody was there to care for them. And he went and he bowed down in his bathroom, got on his knees, and he just prayed and began to pour out his heart to the Lord concerning this. And he said it was as though the Lord just came to him and whispered these, ear, these words in his ear. You're not home yet. Roosevelt... 
he was home. And so he got the fanfare of those people from his country. These people weren't there yet. It might be the off-scouring of the world. People might not notice what you do, how well you run in this race, the love you pour out, the work that you do. But I'll tell you, there is a set of eyes that's watching and keeping record. And Jesus said, you should rejoice exceedingly. He said, for your reward in heaven is great. But we're just aliens now. Be vigilant. Jesus said, watch. Your enemy is trying to take you out of the race. He's strategizing it as to how to do it. And you're not home yet. He that is with us is greater. He that helps us run is greater. And the witnesses bear witness to that very fact. Abiding in Christ, you'll make it. But don't turn your eyes off of Him. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Your fastest way to fail, your fastest way to go back is take your eyes off of Christ. You need to look unto Him. You need to lay hold on Him. You need to cling to Him. You need to hold close to Him. You have opportunity to go back, but I tell you, don't go back. Your soul is at stake. Eternity is at stake. All that is precious is at stake. Eternal glory is at stake. You have an opportunity to go to hell. And I advise you, don't take it. Let's pray. Lord, fan and fuel our desire for that better country. Lord, do whatever You have to do in our lives. Do whatever You have to do to make us ache for the glory of Christ. Give us an ache. Give us a desire. Give us a deep, deep hunger, Lord, to have that at all costs, at all expense. To have those freely purchased glories that await those that rest in all that Christ has done for sinners. Lord, cause us to ache for home. Give us the best desires, Lord. Preserve us with good desire. Lord, I pray that our faith would stand that test. Give us enduring faith all the way to the end. Have mercy, Lord. Amen.